heading to two in Texas, you have four dues. So we're working on FRQs uh, pretty much every problem. Once in a while, they'll throw in a multiple choice, but pretty much all FRQs. So as always with an FRQ, they give you information and then they have a question. So uh, this is something I think I mentioned earlier in the year, but it's been a while. So I'll re-emphasize. As I read this problem, uh, they state that the rate, uh, that's a key word in every AP problem I've ever encountered. Uh, so what I would do is, okay, it hasn't really been that important yet, but it's going to become increasingly important to keep track of what they're actually giving you. R of T is a rate. So if I were making a Danica's chart here, I'd have R of T, and that's my rate. And that means over here there's an amount of something. And over here is the rate of the rate. So this relationship is going to show up in pretty much every AP problem you work. Um, there's a, an amount of something, there's a rate at which the amount changes, and then there's the rate at which the rate itself changes. So in this problem, they're giving us information about a rate. Uh, that's why the units are gallons per hour. So as always, it's really important that you not just do steps in this class. It's important that you keep track of what, you know, what the steps represent, what they mean. So it says the rate at which water flows out of a pipe. So the amount's going to be some amount of water. So the units here are going to be gallons. The rate, therefore, is gallons per hour. And the rate of the rate is gallons per hour every hour like that. And that pattern is going to be consistent throughout the rest of the year. Questions? It really makes a huge difference if you keep track of the units. It will just help keep you from making a mistake. So the rate at which water flows out of a pipe in gallons per hour is given by the differentiable function R. So R is a rate. Table, go, table above shows the rate measured every three hours. Use data in the table to find an approximation. Keyword here is approximation. So we're not finding an exact value, we're only approximating R prime of 12. Show the computations that lead to your answer, indicate units of measure. Okay, they're giving me R, they're asking me to figure out an approximation for R prime of 12. That means they want me to come over to this column. They want me to find R prime at time 12. That means they want me to find the rate at which the rate itself is changing at hour 12. The rate at which the rate itself is changing at hour 12. Questions? Cool. Okay, uh, it turns out to be a really simple computation. What I do is I notice that at hour 12, the rate is 11.4 gallons per hour. But I'm trying to find out how fast that rate is changing. And what I observe is, I pay attention to the fact that at hour nine, the rate was 11.2, and at hour 15, the rate is 11.3. So I can kind of interpret it one of two ways. I could say, well, in this three hour period, the rate went up by 0.2. So I could say R prime of 12. Let's see, the rate was 11.2, now it's 11.4. So that means my rate's going up. So I take 11.4, because I have to show my computations. So I show the grader that I'm observing that the rate went up by 0.2 gallons per hour. And that increase in the rate occurred over a three hour time period. 
that was from hour 12 to hour 9. I have to show my computations. It says right here, show your computations. So that happened over three hours. So that's my estimate for how fast the rate is increasing at hour 12. The rate's going up by 0.2 gallons per hour over a three hour time period. So that's my estimate for how fast the rate is increasing at hour 12. Questions about anything? Please. Um, the units for when we do acceleration problems is usually like meters per second squared. So why is this one not gallons per hour squared? Uh, you can actually do it either way. Uh, they don't care. They'll accept either answer. So you could write this. Uh, two points for Jonathan. Uh, totally acceptable. Is that what you meant? Perfect. Please. Sarah. Is it okay that there's a decimal in the fraction, or do like is, is that okay if we leave that in the written section, for example? Gotcha. You are required to show this. Uh, it's just one of the rules of the test that because they said show your computations, I have to have the blue box. Uh, after that, you don't. There's not really any requirement. Uh, if I leave it, in fact, you can do this. You could write 11.4, two points for zero, minus 11.2, all over 12 minus 9. And as long as you included the units, so you wrote gallons per hour squared or gallons per hour per hour, uh, that blue answer here would also get full credit. Like there's no requirement on the AP test to simplify anything numerically. So it doesn't really... In fact, the best advice is to stop here at the blue, because if you go further, you risk making a simple mistake and losing a point. So we're going to practice stopping here. I kept going because it kind of helps to make sense of the idea. In fact, somebody has a calculator. Carl, real quick. What's 0 0.2 divided by 3? Point what? Say again. Point zero six 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 and then the seven. Gotcha. Yeah. So we'll do three decimals. So point zero six seven. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend. Like I don't want you to do this on the test because you risk making a mistake. But it does help me kind of understand what I'm really talking about. I'm saying that. Because from hour 9 to hour 12, the rate is going up by 0.67 gallons per hour every hour. That's my estimate for how fast the rate is going up at hour 12. It's not an exact value, it's just an approximation. It should make sense to you. If it doesn't make sense to you, you want to keep talking. Like it's saying, okay. If the rate's going to go up by 0.2 over three hours, that means every hour the rate's got to go up by this amount so that in three hours it goes up by 0.2. That's the idea. We want to talk about it more. Please, Nelson. Um, so does it also work if you're to find the change between 12 and 15? Yeah, in fact, they'll go either way. So I went from 9 to 12 and then made that my estimate. If you went from 12 to 15, you'd get full credit as well. You get a totally different answer because then you're estimating the rate's actually going down mm -hmm. because we don't really know exactly what's happening. We know from 9 to 12 the rate went up, but then it went down. So right at hour 12, we don't have any way to know whether the rate's actually going up or down. So they'll accept either way. Two points. Would it be a better approximation if you went from 9 to 15 and then increase the denominator as well? Uh, two points for David. They'll accept that one also. <laughs> because again, without more data, there's no way to determine which of the three methods would be best. Yeah. There, it's impossible because we don't have enough information. So any of those three methods would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to the next one. This one's a bit more straightforward. It's the same idea. Get the board to work. 
Okay, it says, uh, so it's the same table. It says use data in the table to find an approximation for r prime of seven. So now we're looking to find out how is r changing at hour seven. But in this case, we don't have any of that, uh, how would you say, ambiguity, like that uncertainty as to what method we should use. There's only one choice. Hour seven falls between hour six and hour nine. So they're going to expect you to write on your paper, r prime of seven is approximately, well, before hour seven, the rate was 11, I'm sorry, 10.4. I'm off cock, you're right, I'm kind of cockeyed here, sorry. So at hour six, <laughs> the rate is 10.8. And then at hour nine, the rate is 11.2. So I write down on my paper here that the rate definitely went up from hour six to hour nine. Uh, that change in the rate occurred over a three hour time period. And I'm also supposed to include my units. So I would write gallons per hour. every hour, and I would stop right there, and I would get full credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no need to do anything else, just, just stop. Questions? It is important to note that we just found a secant slope of the graph of R, because we found the slope between two points on R, we're finding a secant slope, and we're using that to approximate a tangent slope. Because r prime of 7 represents the tangent slope of r at hour 7. So this is our approximation. I should have written an approximation sign, although I don't, I've never seen them dot points for that little kind of mistake. So we just approximated a tangent slope by finding a secant slope. There, please. So on the last problem, when it asks us to find uh, like the like r prime at twelve, uh, what I did was I found the secant slope of nine to twelve, and then twelve to thirteen, and then I put the that like the value of r prime at twelve would fall in between the secant slope for that part and that part. Would that be also an acceptable answer? Hold on. Let me say that back to the class. <coughs> Start off the new year right with a ticket, of course. Uh, no, outstanding question. What you're remembering is something that we've seen in multiple choice questions, where they'll say, and they give in a situation basically identical, and they'll say, you know, what is a what is a possible value for r prime of say 12? And what you had to do on those multiple choice questions was exactly what Zarin just said. You had to go find the secant slope before 12 the secant slope after hour 12, and therefore because in those problems the curve was concave down or concave up, you had to specify that r prime of 12 was in between. Uh, in this case, it doesn't quite fit because they don't specify any concavity requirement, but the memory is perfect. Um, it, it's different here. We're not doing exactly the same thing, but it's definitely connected and related. Is that? Yeah. yeah. So you wouldn't want to do that here. Uh, here where they ask for an estimate, we'd want to do as we've shown, but it does connect to those other problems really well. It's a good comment. Anybody else? Okay, cool. Uh, next thing, go to this one. You have a formula that you need to memorize. You write this down somewhere in your notes. Put it somewhere where you'll get the formula memorized. down somewhere where you can make sure you get them right. Uh, 
flashcards are always a good idea. If anybody needs flashcards, just let me know. I'll hand you one. So this problem says, it's the same situation again, but the question asks, uh, approximate the average rate. Average rate, so we're trying to find the average of R. How much water is flowing out of the pipe during the 24 hour period? They say to approximate that average rate using a midpoint Riemann sum. Okay, it's important at this juncture in the class that you separate uh, integration into two kind of ideas. You've got to think of, okay, there are reasons why I need to perform an integral, and then there are methods for how I actually compute the integral. You need to keep those ideas separate in your mind. Because when we work problems from this point forward, the first thing we're going to be doing is thinking about, okay, why am I doing the integral? What am I trying to accomplish by using integration? Then the second thing you're going to have to determine is how am I supposed to actually compute the integral itself? So there's the setup of the integral and then there's the computation of the integral. This problem contains both of those pieces because it says approximate the average rate at which water is flowing out of the pipe. So I'm trying to find the average of R. Well, the formula I just gave you says the average of R is going to be the integral of R itself And I'm trying to find that average over the 24 hour time period. So I'm going to start at time 0 and go to time 24. In the formula I gave you, I just made an example of from 3 to 7. It can be anything. I integrate what I'm trying to average and then I multiply by 1 over the width of the integral. That's how I compute the average of anything. So I compute the average of anything. So I'm trying to find the average of R. So if I integrate R and then multiply by 1 over, I'll get the average of R itself. Question. Please. So your formula is for the average value and then f of x, which is, is that on Danica's chart, is that f? Is that the middle one or is that the f that the f? Uh, outstanding question. It really wouldn't matter. I could find the average of the amount. I could find the average of the rate itself. Or I could find the average of the rate of the rate. So this works for this works for anything. Uh, I can find the average of any value, any rate, any rate of the rate. Doesn't matter. Point. Please. But it's only with two subintervals, right? Because there's just the three and the seven. Oh, good question. That's where we've got to keep separate in our mind these two ideas. Uh, one being, you know, what's the purpose of the integral? So the purpose of the integral in this problem is to compute the average of R. Then there's the method we're going to use to actually do the computation. Like, how do we actually compute the integral? Uh, in this problem, they're going to ask us to compute the integral using a midpoint Riemann sum. But that's totally separate from the formula itself. Okay. So this has nothing to do with Riemann sum at all. That's just right here. That's the reason we're doing the integral is so that we can find the average of R. The method we're going to use to compute the integral is a midpoint Riemann sum. So totally separate. Does that answer your question? That does, yeah. Two points. Okay, so there's the setup and there's the computation. Uh, and again, that's going to be uh, that's going to be very repetitive in the future. We're going to keep doing that over and over. So here's our setup. We've set up the integral. Now we need to compute the integral. So this is where we say, okay, how do I actually compute this integral? I'm supposed to do a midpoint Riemann sum with two subintervals. So because I'm integrating from zero to twenty-four. 
I break up the time period into two subintervals, 0 to 12 and 0 to, tw sorry, 12 to 24. Don't forget this multiplier, that's a common error. So I'm going to write 1 over 24 multiplied by, uh, reviewing from a couple weeks ago, so when you do the midpoint sum, all you're doing is taking values of r multiplied by dt. Because I only have two subintervals and I've got to cover a time period of 24 hours, that means each subinterval is 12 hours long. So my dt is 12. And we want to talk more about why dt is 12. So I go to the first subinterval, I pick the value of r that is in the middle of the first subinterval. So I'm going to pick 10.8. I'm finding r of 6. In fact, you could write that if you like. You don't have to, but it might help you remember well, how this works. So I'm taking the value of r that is in the middle of the subinterval, that's r of 6. I'm multiplying by dt, which is 12. I repeat that process for the next subinterval. So that will be r of 18 multiplied by 12. So this is my setup. This is why I am performing the integral. It's in order to compute the average of r. This is my method of computation. I'm doing a Riemann sum. The 1 over 24 has nothing to do with the Riemann sum. That's there because of what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm trying to find the average of r, so I have to have the 1 over 24 multiplier. But only this is the Riemann sum portion of the problem. Question. Awesome. I can't stop there. I've got to go one more step because I can't leave it as r of 6. But I can leave it as what I'm about to write in purple. Uh, R of 6 is 10.8. That gets multiplied by 12 plus 10.7. Like that. I do want to put units. I am finding the average of R. Therefore, the average rate has to have the same units as the rate itself. It's just an average. So I would put gallons per hour. And I would not go further. Uh, that will get me full credit. Please. On this specific question, do we need to write the initial formula with the 0 to 24 RCDT and then the approximation equals sign. Oh, gotcha. So Daniel's asking, do we have to write this, yes? Yeah. Gotcha. The true answer is not necessarily, but it's a little hard to predict whether they'll give you points for it or not. So my recommendation, strong recommendation, is always write it. Because I've seen far too many problems where they did give points for writing it, and you don't want to lose those points just because you did it. I've seen some where they don't, but they give quite, a, it's been pretty common. So my rule of thumb is every time I perform an integral, I'm always going to write the integral first. Yep, good question. Perfect. Let's keep going. Okay, new situation. Uh, now we have a graph. It's a graph of what they are calling F, so no story here. So the situation is pretty simple. It's just a graph of F. It says find a right Riemann sum approximation of this integral. So in this situation, there's no specific reason why we are computing an integral. They're just giving us an integral and they're asking us to find the value. So answering Daniel's question, they're not going to give me points for writing what I am now writing. It's just my habit. I always write an integral before I compute the integral because I don't want to lose points if they happen to give points for doing so. So I'm going to write that. 
Now I just need to find an approximation of that integral. So now I'm doing the, the computation of the integral. I'm supposed to use three subintervals of equal length. So let's give points to the whole room. So if I'm supposed to integrate from negative 3 to 15, I'm supposed to do it in three subintervals. Uh, just reviewing from before Christmas break. Uh, raise your hand and tell me the first subinterval goes from what to what? Like what's the span of the first subinterval? Let's go Tanner. Uh, negative 3 to 3. So my first subinterval has got to go from negative 3 to 3. Show me your hands if you knew it. 43 for 10. We need to talk more about it. Please. Why don't we have the fraction before the Say again. Why don't we have the fraction before the integral? Awesome. I want everyone who knows to answer this. Uh, it goes back to the idea that you want to make sure you're keeping track of, okay, why am I computing an integral and how do I compute the integral? In this problem, there's no why. They just said, here's an integral, please compute it. In the previous problem, there was a why. The why that we were answering was, hey, we're supposed to find the average of r. So to find the average of r, we needed this formula here which includes the extra 1 over 24. And I just botched the chance to ask a question because I just gave it away. In this problem, they didn't say anything about finding the average of f. They just said, find this integral. They don't give us any reason why we're finding it. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, just kind of straight math without any story. If they had said, find the average of f, uh, we would have had to start differently. We would have had to have had 1 over uh, 15 minus negative 3, like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I'm paying a ticket for that one. I really like that question. What else? Cool. So I don't need to worry about that in this problem. Get rid of that. So we know the next subinterval would go from here to here. Oops. Like that. Uh, therefore, we're supposed to take f multiplied by dt for each subinterval. So raise your hands up. Hey, what's the first thing I should be writing here? What do I write first? I'm doing a right Riemann sum of this integral, three subintervals. So I've got to take f times dt three times. So what's the first thing I write? Yeah, it's more. First thing. About half of you. Let's go, Logan. Uh, would it be f of three times six? Nicely done. So he goes to the first subinterval. He goes to the right of the first subinterval, which is a value of x equal 3, that, or t in this case. That t gets plugged in. Fix that. So we're finding f of 3. And then we're multiplying by the dt, or change in time, or difference in time for that first subinterval. That difference is 6. So that's my first term right there. Show me your hands if you knew that before you said it. Two points, three for a Anything, questions, concerns, just anything? You need me to review it just Carl. Just really quickly, the right Riemann sum, when you take like the right side of it, that's going to be an overestimate, correct? Oh, good question. We're gonna be, and then midpoint's closest, and then left is going to be a slight underestimate. Uh, or generally. Let's, let's review that real quick. So here's what Carl's remembering from before Christmas. If we're doing an integral, and the function we happen to be integrating is strictly decreasing. In fact, to answer those questions about, is the Riemann sum an over, under estimate, I always go to a picture. Like, there are rules you can memorize, but I find it harder to memorize the rules. So I think, okay, if I'm integrating f, and f is strictly decreasing, 
when I do a, say, left Riemann sum, I'm going to go the left side of the subinterval. I'm going to pick the value of f on the left. And I'm going to multiply that by dt. So I'm going to get an overestimate. But if, and that would be with a left Riemann sum. However, if f were strictly increasing, something like this, and I did a left Riemann sum, when I go to the left side of the subinterval and I multiply by dt, I get an underestimate. So it varies depending on whether f is increasing or decreasing, or whether I'm doing a left or right. And if it's both increasing and decreasing, you just kind of? It's probably too complicated. I've never seen them ask that question. All right. Uh, if it's increasing and decreasing. If it did, I would still just draw the picture. Okay. Like right here, I would say, OK, for this, in fact, this one, I don't think they're ever going to ask anything like this because we've got values of f that are negative and positive. So it gets complicated very quickly. So I don't really want to go that deep. But really, if they're asking whether you have an over or underestimate, I've never seen them get more complicated than something like what I'm showing you here, where you're simply observing f either decreasing or f increasing, like that. Does that help at all? Yeah. Okay, two points. Anybody else? Okay, cool. So back to here. Uh, hands up, what's the next term? What gets written here? Hands. You can always think with me, don't just walk. What gets next here, Ilana? Ah, shoot. Well, it's that here for her full, the entire first semester. So sorry, family. Go ahead. So f of 9 times 6. How many knew it? Just points three for Cambria. And then the last term, please, hands quick. Let's go there. 15 times 6. How many knew it? Two points three for Derek. Question. Can we just slide up the blue by looking at the graph? Yeah, so two for Zarin is leading into exactly the next step. It's an FRQ, so we want to practice stopping as quick as we can. You don't want to go farther than you have to, because it just takes extra time and it risks making a mistake. You can't stop where I've stopped so far. Like you're not allowed to leave uh, the f of 3, you have to actually, you know, replace f of 3 with a numeric value. And then you do exactly what Zarin did. You simply look at the graph of f and identify that f of 3 is 1. So I can write 1 times 6 plus f of 9, 1 again. And ask me why I use parentheses here and not here. I have no idea. Um, and then this is negative one. That would require, no, you can actually, uh, whatever. Um, now I do want to stop. I don't want to go further. There's no reason. Eric, please. For a simple computation like that, would it be easier so then, like, the graders won't get messed up by, if you have, like, a lot of work in the area? They should just go all the way and solve it all the way? Oh, gotcha. So because they didn't say show the work or anything, if you were simply to write on your paper, let's see, six, uh, you'd get full credit as well. Got you, right? Kind of. Yeah. What do you have? I want to make sure I answer your question, though, if I didn't answer it's, it well. If, like, simple complications like that, where you can just do it in your head and it's just easy, um, is it, should you simplify it to the correct answers so then the graders won't get, like, confused by it if you have, like, a lot of work or if you're, like, oh. busy or something like that? Let me see if this answers it. If not, keep talking to me. Uh, I'm going to show you examples in the future where what you have written down looks like kind of a mess. It's like it's just all kinds of terms and everything. And as long as it's correct, you get full credit. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to like go further. You don't have to make it easier for the grader to see it. Uh, it's their job to go through each and everything that you've written. And as long as it's correct and there's no need to simplify, full credit. 
Is that your question? Yeah. Which question? The BL. Awesome. Let's keep going. Okay, problem one in the packet gives that same situation, so that's not anything new. Now, the question does introduce a new idea. The question says, okay, the rate of flow, the rate of water flow, R, can be approximated by this formula. Uh, this is extremely common on the AP test every year to give a situation where they give you a table. The table represents recorded values. You have to kind of imagine the idea that you actually have a pipe somewhere. There's a flow meter on the pipe right here. And every three hours, someone writes down the flow. That's what you're seeing in the table, is what somebody recorded every three hours. The formula Q is some mathematician or engineer's model of the table. So they are not a perfect match. If you put this in your calculator and make a table for Q, it will look very much like this table, but it won't be exactly the same. Because the table is the recorded values, the formula is somebody's idea of how to mathematically model those recorded values. You need me to talk more about the difference between R and Q. It's important that you notice the difference. They will, they will test you on it. They've done it pretty much every year for several years now. Okay, so it's important that as you're reading the problem, you keep track of, am I supposed to be using R or am I supposed to be using Q? They said use Q to approximate the average rate of water flow. So they're asking us to find the average of Q this time. So back to that idea of there's a reason why we need to perform an integral, there's a, then there's a method of computation to compute the integral. So the why now is we want to find the average of Q. So we have to write down 1 over the time period, 24 minus 0, and we're averaging Q. So it's very similar to what was asked here. This time we're finding the average rate uh, of water flowing out of the pipe. We had no formula Q. All we had was the data R. So we were finding the average of R. Well, we're still finding the average rate of water flow. There's just two different ways we discovered to describe the water flow. One way is by the actual table values. The other way is with this model Q. So now we're finding the average of Q. You want me to talk more about the difference between those two problems. They're asking for the same thing. They just want you to use two different ways of measuring the water flow, one through a mathematical model and one through the actual tabulated values. Please, Nelson. So, so you get the values of Q. Should we plug in like uh, 26 and 18? Gotcha. Hold on. Perfect question. So Nielsen's question is, okay, wait a minute. Back here, when I found the average of R, which is also the water flow, I started with the same formula, basically, except that instead of integrating Q, I'm integrating R. So that was the reason why I'm doing the integral, to find the average of R. In this problem, they specified that the integral should be computed using a midpoint Riemann sum. So we had to go to, you know, okay, first subinterval, uh, value in the middle of each subinterval, that, that sort of thinking. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But in this new problem, we're still finding the average of the water flow. We're just using Q to represent the water flow. So here's my Y. Here's, here's the reason I'm doing the integral is right here. They did not specify that I should do a Riemann sum in order to perform this computation. Because it is a calculator allowed problem and I have a formula, my method of computation this time is going to be simply to pick up my calculator. 
and do a million subintervals, I just punch it in. That's it. Question. Perfect question. So nothing more to do other than just pick it up, type it in. So what I would do is I would put Q in Y1, and then on my calculator I'm going to type 1 over 24, math 9, 0 to 24, and I'm going to select Y1, and then DX, like that. Don't ever write this on your paper though, it's one of the rules of the test. Not allowed to use the Y1 symbol on your written work. That's simply what you type in the calculator. Just wave at me if you need me to show the calculator again. It's been a couple of weeks, okay? So I go to my calculator. 1993C. This will work when I have to walk to my jobs. Yeah, it's on the wrong screen. Hold on. Division, you lose two points because you lose a point because what you've written over here is wrong so they deduct a point there and you lose a second point because your decimal answer will also be wrong that would be a problem that's often worth three points right there so two points probably one for the setup. No, three points because of the units. So. Questions about anything? Let's keep going. We've got another couple minutes. Problem three says, what is the average or mean value of this formula over that interval? So if I want to find the average of anything, I simply integrate whatever I'm averaging. integrate whatever I'm averaging. I'm supposed to integrate from negative 1 until 2. Because I'm finding an average, I can't forget the division here. If you think about how you found the average of just a few numbers, this kind of helps. Because we always divide by how many we're adding up. That's really how this formula kind of works. So questions. So this is the why. They asked me to compute an integral. Well, they asked me to find an average. Now I can just type it in my calculator. 